dream of existence was an expansion of the power of the living earth. The living earth is a concept that I picked up from Lovelock and Margulis in the 1990s. That was their Gaia hypothesis. And I no longer call it the Gaia hypothesis because the term Gaia has been co-opted and used in a number of different ways that I believe now that when you say the term Gaia, the perception and the reality of the bulk of Americans takes them to some place where they're thinking Gaia TV and Blue Avians and David Wilcock and the whole Curry Good Chicken episode. Um, I no longer disbelieve Corey Good. I initially, when I heard what came out, I believed it for a bit, and then it got too strange, and I disbelieved it. And then I got a push where I thought I was being told what to believe and rejected it completely because I don't like being presented with scenarios that other people believe that I'm forced to buy in or not buy in on an absolute basis, but I bought in as a no on an absolute basis and keep open some questions that I have to allow things to flow. So in the pattern of thinking that Dr. Lenny has come up with, Corey Good, David Wilcock, and the entire secret space program are a viable scenario for the future of humanity. And for that to take place, there will be a transformation from what we have now into a culture that is capable of not only getting through the Van Allen belts and into space, but realizes a place amongst other humans in space and falls directly into what we've been taught through our movies like Star Wars and Men in Black, our television shows like Star Trek, and uh, oh, what was the one about the, the hole that they had where they could jump through and be in different times? Um, it had the same guy who was MacGyver in it. I forget. I would love to be able to help you, Doc, but I have no idea. Yeah. it. The problem with watching television after I had gone out of the television mode is that I set my memory that when I watched it, I didn't remember it. And the so... The audience says Stargate. Stargate. That's it. Thank you. And the Stargate stuff really, if you look at it, it kind of has to be true. And so if Stargate has to be true, but it's presented in a way to make it false, then what actually is true is a question of what we believe. And so taking people who believe in different things and giving them their voice to express how it differs from reality is something that we people with open minds absolutely need to do. And so now I'm joined by a fellow traveler in the world of not real reality, Bridget Lynn Dolgoff. Hi, Bridget. Finally, welcome. Um, hold on, let me see. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, I've got a little bit of a lag time because my power was out and on a tablet, so it's trying to upload a whole bunch of updates. <laughs> so probably in a couple of minutes, it'll be a little bit better. Don't you know it always works that way? I mean, this morning when I went to YouTube, YouTube wanted me to update before I could actually get to play the bumper music, and it's like... No, 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 no. We want to play the bumper music now. We don't want to update. So I have a YouTube update coming. <laughs> so your power was out overnight? Or did you just wake up to power being out? Yeah. Power being out. So it was a little bit cold. Because obviously the heat had been out for a while. And it's been pretty cold up here in Reno. 
I mean, for the last two months, and I think today it's supposed to start to get like, you know, warm, like over 45, which will be good. But it's been, it's been pretty cold here. Like, you know, 12 degrees at night. Yeah. Um, I'm, kind of stuff. I'm very fortunate. I'm a lot closer to the Pacific in the cold. It's been almost 35 or 40 at night, rather balmy. But I lost power yesterday from 2 in the afternoon until after I had gone to bed. So I really think that they're playing with the power grids in order to kick off some behaviors. Um, well, the thing is, I think I sent you that link about Homeland Security. And I think there was a few universities that were involved that did a um, were paid to do a study on the power grids in the United States. And I think it came out like December 10th or something like that. And they put out, you know, how kind of bad the infrastructure, you know, of the power systems are in the U S I mean, they wouldn't really survive much because they haven't really been upgraded. And that's been time. sort of deliberate, right? Because the people that own the power companies, at least in California, Run right back into the Rothschilds. Well, yeah, I mean, look at Enron, you know, what Enron did to the whole power system, you know, in California. And it did to a whole bunch of people who had, you know, stocks and shares in Enron. I mean, you know, people don't realize, like, um, most, like, federal and state workers had something like, I don't know, 8 to 10 percent, um, you know, that, that the state and the feds chose the stocks for them. And in some cases, some state and federal workers had like 8 to 10% in Enron when it collapsed. And it kind of forced, you know, people like firefighters to have to work another, you know, 8 to 10 years to recover what they lost in their pensions. I mean, I'm not so sure pensions are going to be around very much longer. I'm not sure pensions, pensions are going to be around, around next week. <laughs> Well, that's true, you know. I think the only thing that holds might be the Social Security, just, you know, to keep, I don't know. With all the stuff that's come out, I think people should really prepare for, you know, some pretty difficult times in the United States. Yeah, and I think and that if, if we're prepared for those bad times, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see those bad times, but it does mean that taking the worst case scenario and being ready for it gives us all peace of mind so that if it does come down the way it looks like it might come down, we're at least covered in a reality aspect. Yeah, well, and that's the thing that I did, you know, once I started recognizing what was coming and I grew up just in a different family, you know, I grew up in different kind of family, I think than most people. And so two years ago, um, you know, I started building a food storage. I've got, you know, I've got, I could eat really hearty for like six months. Um, and I've got, you know, seed vaults and everything else. And I've been working on, the garden bed where I'm at. And so it's pretty good. I could plant it. I could even plant a little bit of a winter crop. Um, and I've got six months of good food for my dog. And I've got everything kind of, you know, even though I'm kind of living out of my van on my friend's property, I've kind of been preparing them as well. And we just started filling up gas cans last week. So if we have to use the generator, you know, to get the water out of the well, we're prepared to do that and um, and to see what happens. Because, you know, on that, that Homeland Security um, PDF, it, you know, basically said um, we can expect, you know, from all different kinds, just from s bad storm system failures, because, you know, you have major power grid that covers the whole west coast to the middle and then the other power grid covers the whole east coast to the middle so there really aren't any separated power grids the only power grid that's out of that equation is texas texas has its own power systems it has 
um, you know, they got rid of, um, you know, um, having a monopoly on power in Texas a long time ago. And um, they had to do it in order to utilize solar and wind power um, you- in their state. And, and they had to update their whole grid, you know, all of the power lines and stuff when they went to green power. Would you so, do me a favor? Just, you know, yeah. Can you explain more about how Enron actually worked with the power and the the stuff? Because you, you started that trend at the beginning, oh, yeah. and I'm not sure all the listeners well, are familiar. Was, yeah, I think it was like, what, 2005? that Enron was, like, exposed. Um, and, I mean, you can go look at all that stuff online. I mean, it, it's pretty sadistic, the whole, you know, situation and the people that were running it. But basically, they were the ones that kind of were creating, you know, the price market in California for power. Um, and so they basically gobbled up all the money. California was paying huge amounts in electricity that was totally unnecessary because it was false price, you know, market fixing. Um, and so the, you know, there was like three top guys of the company that were just looting um, the California electrical systems um, and looting, you know, California. And people, you know, had... A lot of people had stock because Enron was considered one of those safe, you know, long-term investment opportunities. And it basically went down in one day um, when it was exposed. And it's interesting because when I was in San Diego, um, the main guy who figured out what Enron was doing was an attorney. But he was an attorney for the people, right, and for um, you know, the better good. And he was one of my clients. Um, and he was the number one guy that took down Enron, exposed uh, what Enron had been doing. And Otherwise, basically, California would probably have, huh? Basically, what Enron yeah. was doing was shuffling off power from different places so that they could recharge, they could sell the same power to different places at different costs. Yeah, price fixing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, scamming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I remember. The, um, yeah, it was a, you know, and the thing is, is like, it, this is the part that always blows me away. I mean, this is how corrupt the United States is. I, I was having a really good talk with a, um, a guy who does for Revolution Radio, where I have my main um, radio show, Karen Stones and Digging Holes. Um, on Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, but they're in Canada. And, you know, there's just so many things that are different about Canada. And it just shows, like, I mean, Canada is still a corporation, you know, it's been incorporated. Uh, and they're trying to figure their legal way out of it as well. Um, but there's just so many more people that are, like, awake in Canada. Um, and we we're talking about how. I mean, just in general, like, you know, um, you know, well, their medical system isn't as good as it used to be, but it used to be just, I used to actually pay insurance to go up and use the medical system because I was traveling up there a lot for work. I was doing a lot of, you know, energetic medicine work and, um, I was working with groups of people and I was doing, um, what I called, uh, energy medicine circles where people would come and uh, we tap into different kinds of energy and, um, you know, travel and go on journeys and stuff like that. So I I actually had my insurance up in Canada for a while um, and I paid U.S. dollar for it. Um, But I would go to the doctors up there because it was so awesome. They had awesome, awesome medicine, alternative and medical and, um, yeah, so, but I was talking to him just about, you know, weed, <laughs> marijuana, and when I started going up to Canada when I was 23, so I'm 50 now, that's like 27 years ago, gosh, it just seems like, I can't believe it was like 20 years, 7 years ago, anyway, but, um, you know, everyone I knew was growing up there because all their industries collapsed, 
because you know collectively they decided they weren't going to overlog their forests um you know i think there's like 32 million people in canada their land mass is a little bit bigger you know equal to the u.s and they don't just allow anybody in you know um people have to take personal responsibility to become a citizen of canada um, you can't just marry somebody and everything's all fine and dandy. Um, their family has to take financial responsibility of you if if a family member decides to marry somebody, or you have to have two hundred fifty thousand dollars liquidity in a bank account, um, you know, to go up there and live or whatever else. But it doesn't make you a citizen. There is no path to citizenship up there, really. <laughs> all right, so. Um, but, you know, they decided to manage their resources in a different way, um, their trees, um, the salmon industry collapsed, a lot of their oil and mining stuff, you know, kind of went down. And so basically marijuana became like the number one business It was being grown all over BC, BC bud. And I mean, that's like 30 years ago where all these people had no jobs. Um, I mean, when I was starting to travel up there, it was bad. It was something like, you know, I think if I gave them a hundred dollars U.S., I was getting like sometimes, you know, hundred and fifty-five dollars back. I mean, that would mean that, you know, their money was like forty-five cents on every U.S. dollar. Um, and just with the the weed, you know, like I look at like how far behind America is with just so many ideas and. And look at where they're at in British Columbia right now with weed medicines. You know, I have friends of mine that grow for scientists that have, um, you know, taken a like part of the DNA out of the bud that deals with pain, and they're actually making pharmaceutical medicines. And they have free clinics where people can go um, and get pain treatment using, you know, marijuana that's been turned into kind of a pill form. Uh, also, same thing with epilepsy. Um, they have the same clinics. Um, I know people who um, have patents now, average Joes that learn chemistry that have been growing weed for, you know, 30 years, um, who are taking out certain CBDs that can actually, one, one dose of the CBD can get anyone off of any kind of addiction, period, end of story, within 24 hours and one dose. So when I look at like the whole infrastructure and just everything in the United States against, you know, Canada, um, we're really like, we're really far behind. I mean, I live in a state, Nevada, where I lived most of my life up until like something like five years ago when we got dispensaries. And then two years after that, it was uh, mar marijuana was recreational legalized. Um, up until like five, six years ago, you could go, it was a zero tolerance state, which means that you could go to prison for 25 years over a seed. So, you know, things are starting to change, I think, a little bit in the United States. But when I look at like just other countries and, you know, how much further along and like talking to the producer of, from my radio network living up in Canada, um, and just, you know, because they'd already, their financial system already tanked, yep. you know, 30 years ago. Our... And so they've already, they've already made a lot of the transitions that are necessary. I mean, they have tons of farming in BC, like up in the Okanagan, they grow tons of like organic good food. Um, there's still like local farms, you know, in a lot of the areas, um, you know. We have a lot of Canadians who come here and participate with us on Friday, which is our Canadian Politics Day. And so they've been telling us a lot about the Yellow Jacket move, Yellow Vest movement in Canada. And that's pretty amazing. So while we have 15 minutes left in the show, can I ask you what your opinions are on Q and the alternate media that seems to follow Q. That's what we were talking about in the last half hour before you joined us. And I'd just like to know right. where you set on it. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of people that have 
have a lot of different opinions, but, you know, the one guy that I really dig in the Q movement, and you also have to realize, like, um, I'm not a big, uh, I find that a lot of the people that are in the Q movement can be pretty heavy Christians, um, and I'm, I'm not really, I don't really consider myself a Christian, you know, I walk more of the red road, um, the native road, um, and so... Some of them, you know, they get a little bit too evangelical, I guess, for me sometimes. But the main guy that I follow that I dig that just, he, this guy just, like, every time he does a video on YouTube, my mouth just drops and hits the floor because it's, like, so unbelievable, like, how this guy decodes things. And his name, um, he, he posts as a serial brain chew. And it's on the And We Know channel, YouTube channel. And periodically, he shows how Trump and Q and all these other people are coding things with multiple layers of coding. Um, and so most of the people that are doing Q and that are reporting Q aren't really going to the deeper levels. And by the time that this guy decodes like the whole, these different posts from Trump, like when Trump had the poster on the table, nobody said anything about it. He decoded that. I mean, like, there's all these codes that are in it. They're speaking to us in codes. And a lot of this coding is based on Grammedia or something like that, which is like biblical code or something. Gematria. And I don't really understand it. I'm not, I'm not a decoder kind of person. Um, but every time I watch his thing, it just blows me away. I mean, I'm just so blown away by the time it's done that, like, literally my my jaw has hit the table. And there's just no way that, I mean, he's really decoding it because he's coming up with these different answers, and they actually are leading to real clues on the Internet. And it just, it just can't really be faked. I mean, you know how much time and effort it takes to code things? You know, you put out something like a tweet or a Q post and has a difference in 10 minutes or a certain amount of time and how that correlates into the code and all this other stuff. There's just no way you have to be really good at this in order to pull that kind of stuff off. And then you have to be really good. And it, I think the guy who does it was in the military and dealt with coding or decoding. And so that's why he has the channel, because he started to notice that there's all these, you know, links and stuff like that. that there's these codes. Um, and then he started decoding this stuff. And then he was like, wow, you know, there's like, <laughs> so, there's like so much more going on. So, you know, I'm for minimalistic government. And, you know, I'll tell you something that just recently happened that also really leads me to believe um, what is going on is going on. Now, you know, Trump was elected, um, you know, part of the corporation um, because he's the sitting president of a corporation, which was copy-pasted, the United States of America Corporation, which was copy-pasted over the America. And, and so he's a president of a corporation, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, that's a corporation. That's not a democracy. That's not a, you know, thing. So, you know, I'm on the fence about the government and what the government's going to come back to. And in the United States, we want it to go back to the Republic, um, the original kind of, um, and maybe, you know, even before that, where, you yeah, know, that's what I was thinking is on. I'm not sure I want a Republic. I'm, I'm more likely to want common law. Well, the thing is, that's what a lot of us practice, but I think we can go back even further. Natural law? Native people. Well, we, we, it's more inclusive to all cultures. Because, you know, still, if we went back to the original United States Constitution, in there, um, women are still not free, right? So we're still property because that Constitution hasn't been developed. So when they copy-pasted a different Constitution, they started adding all of these um inclusions into the law and then women got rights and whatever else that's under the copy pasted you know constitution so 
um, when I go, say I want to go do common law, say when the state started coming after me for my private practice, you know, I had a practice, traditional osteopath, um, I did energy and structural medicine, I have for 30 years, do it on people and animals. And, um, and so when the state started coming after me, you know, I had to learn law. So I went back to the original constitution um, and started practicing common law. And so then I would file against these people that were coming after me. So they were um, non-judicial um, uh, legal remedy actions um, that I was taking against them to let them know that they've been trespassing and whatever else, because you know they came at me pretty harsh. Nowadays, they just murder alternative medicine people. They don't even mess around with us because they, they realize a lot of us are pretty smart and we'll fight we'll fight tooth and nail. So now they just murder us. They don't, in my day, you know, 15 years ago, well, I think the first one was 2009. So 10 years ago, they just came at you, arrested you, tried to arrest you, discredited you, fake cease and desist, threatened all your clients, um, you know, and continue to threaten you for long periods of time, pulling you over every day. They had the cops involved and everybody. So um, so when I learned the common law, but so then when, if it was a big load of paperwork that I created, I had to have a father or a husband under the old established, co um, co constitution of common law represent me, right? Because that's the, that's that law. That's how that law works. Right. Uh, even Judge Anna, when she has to file paperwork on behalf of her family, her husband has to go down and actually do the filing as a man. So I would like to see, like, it go back to maybe natural law, right? Right. Where there is no, like, written law, where we don't have to defend ourselves in written law. But that means that society is going to have to change because we're going to have to change from a taker society to a giving society. And we'll have to create communities where people who are takers will end up disincluding themselves from the communities because of their acts and behaviors. And so this could take a long time in order for things to change. But I do feel that the law of the Republic is being brought back to um, the United States because recently um, I finally got food stamps after eight years. And um, I got a call from my food stamp um, representative and mind you, it's a federal program that operates in a state. And what she said to me was that um, we're paying you for your February benefits um, at the end of January, and we don't really know what's going to happen come March 1st, blah, 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 blah. Talked to her for a little while about that. And so there's uncertainty whether people are going to be getting food stamps anymore in the United States. And there's 44 million people. Well, then I was talking to another person I know, and they were saying, well, um, the federal Trump is getting rid of a lot of these federal programs, because if you go back to the original Constitution, each state was its own country. And so each state is should be paying for their food stamps, should be paying for their welfare, should be you know, paying for all of their programs. And the federal government shouldn't be dangling a carrot of money over the states. And so it turns out that Trump has signed documents and paperwork returning the food stamp program to the individual states, which means that he's closing down the federal government. I mean, in a way where it's going to have very little power over the original states. But this is the big problem. The, the states are not prepared. They've been taking federal subsidies forever and not generating their own production which producing anything, which means that they're not producing any money and their people don't have jobs. So there's just no way a state could carry on food stamp or welfare programs when they're all broke and they've all been feeding off the big boob of the federal government. So it's good that the federal government, this is happening and the federal government's being downsized um, and that the states are going to be, you know, have to be self-sufficient. But the problem is, is that they've basically done nothing 
to make better education systems in each individual state because those have been federally regulated as well and funded. Um, the food stamps, welfare, you know, all these different kinds of programs. Um, I mean, the state of Nevada, you know, we went totally belly up in 2009. We went from a six billion budget for two years to a three billion by 2010. And, and basically got rid of 2,500 teachers. So it's just gonna be really interesting when it all comes down because the states, most states are not prepared to manage all these things on their own. And I don't really see, I see they're gonna have to be proactive in creating jobs and, and different kinds of ideas in order to get people back in the game financially so that they can pay their bills and, and get food and whatever else. States are actually state. too big and that we have to go down even further and restore local control to local people, including ownership. Right, but that's, right, but that's, that's you know, like I've lobbied, um, <coughs> you know, in 2009, you know, I've gone through the whole gamut and I had people that wanted me to run for a Senate seat um, in, you know, our local legislative um, thing back in 2009 and I didn't want to. And so you're going to have to have people that are going to want to step up who have education and knowledge that want to help fix the system in their local communities. And the problem is in the U.S. is the education system. I mean, the bottom line is Nevada is ranked 50th in the United States out of 50 states as the worst education systems. And so people here start dropping out of school really young. There's a lot of teen pregnancies. And there's a heavy amount of drug use that happens, right? I mean, the addiction here is like enormous. And we also have gambling. We have legalized prostitution. Um, so people can literally go sit at a bar indefinitely. If you have money, you can sit at a bar indefinitely at the same bar stool, drink, you know, all day and night, and the bar doesn't shut. We have 24-hour gambling and drinking and whatever you want. So... Those are not conducive to, you know, a healthy population. It makes everybody a welfare recipient, right? For you got that right. Or um, some kind of, you know, medical care. I mean, obesity is is a is a medical disease now. So you can get actually disability because you have obesity. I mean, what that those people need to do, and I know this sounds harsh, is like get up and go for a walk <laughs> or two or three. I mean, those kinds of things, the medical system has also been allowed to loot the federal systems as well by creating all.